Hello, welcome to this community newspaper Facebook's holiday party. Excellence in education. This is Marta Perez and our mission is to expose and inspire excellence in education. And before I introduce our very extremely important guest, uh, please note that here at Community Newspaper, we use all safety precautions. We wear masks when we're not seated. We use hand sanitizers. Our temperatures are checked when we walk in. And then we have this wonderful plexiglass shield between speakers. Also, please follow us on Facebook and send questions to our chat room. And now, I am so very pleased to introduce one of the heroes of Miami-Dade County and the United States. He is Mitch Kaplan, a name synonymous with integrity, kindness, and books. And now books made into films and great bookstores. He is a wonderful role model for all of us in his many attributes, but particularly to our students. He has received countless national and international honors of the highest order, not only for his altruism, but also for creating the best book fair in the United States, the Miami Book Fair, books, stores, author events, you name it, Mitch is there and fits so appropriately with the mission of this program, Excellence in Education. And in an incredible man, an incredible career, Mr. Mitch Kaplan. Welcome. Oh, my. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction. I really. You deserve you. that and more. Uh, I wasn't sure where to start in this interview, but I will tell you that everyone I know uh, that I, I've said something about you, they they have the, the nicest things to say oh, about that's you. So nice. And, and I think that uh, intellectual intelligence is very important, and that's what we deal with here in uh, education, but emotional intelligence that's... is so important. And you fit both uh, academic intelligence and emotional intelligence, and I think that has helped to propel your career. Well, I thank you so, so much. And, you know, I can throw that right back at you because we've known each other for a number of years and everything that I know about you uh, is equally um, equally the same. Well, I mean, thank you. what you value is what I value, yes. and that is education. I'm a, I'm a product of the Miami-Dade public school system. I'm a huge advocate. I taught, before opening the bookshop, I taught uh -huh. high school English mm -hmm. uh, here in Dade County. Mm -hmm. So... I am, um, I am, uh, I am a supporter of all that you do, all that the district does, and I am just so happy to be here. With <laughs> Thank you. you so much. Now, first <laughs> of all, uh, tell us about your first job. Oh, that's a great question. You're not going to believe this, but, but it ties into where I went to high school. So. I went to Miami Beach Senior High School, and in those days, a um, long, long time ago, um, they were experimenting with what they called the Quinmester system. So it meant, I don't know if you remember that at all, but it meant that you could double up on classes. They were trying to treat high school a little like college. So I could take two English classes and all of that, and I actually graduated a little early uh, from high school because I was able to get my English. How my old were you when you graduated? I was 17, but I graduated instead of June, I graduated in March. Okay. And so my very first job in March was I worked construction at the Orange Bowl. Oh. And they were replacing the AstroTurf at the Orange Bowl. Oh, my goodness. And I was on the crew to rip up the old AstroTurf. <laughs> so it was a little bit like being on the chain gang. You know, I was like there <laughs> scraping away the art. But I made, I think it was $2.99 an hour, and I felt like I was, you know, in heaven doing and, that. And thing. where did you go from there in your, so, your job and education? So uh, my first job after college. So after Miami Beach High School, I went to University of Colorado, believe it or not. And there was actually a book in, there's a book in that story 
that got me out to the mountains. I had never, I grew up in Miami Beach. I had never seen mountains. I had never seen snow. Uh -huh. So I thought, I had read a book by Jack Kerouac, actually, called The Dharma Bums. Uh -huh. And in that book, there is a poet who lives on the top of a mountain writing poetry. And being a dreamy kid, you know, who had all these fantasies about doing stuff that I didn't know what I was doing, I thought, you know, living on the mountains might be a great thing. <laughs> so in those days, I, I just got an application, went to University of Colorado, and I studied English there. And it just so happened that it was perfect for me to be there at the time. It was all serendipitously, because at the time, a lot of poets and a lot of writers were congregating in Colorado, in Boulder, and I was able to be a witness to all of these amazing writers who, who were living out there at, this, at that time. So, so you thoroughly enjoyed, you didn't miss Miami when, when... I missed the ocean, I think, but you know, when you're 17, you know, you're exploring the world, and in those days, and I, I try to tell it to my kids and younger people, when you're, un, you're disconnected in those days, there was no internet, there was no cell phone, so you really felt like you were going out into the world on your own, and there was something very liberating about that at uh -huh. that time. Yes. And then after that, I came back to Earth, <laughs> and I uh, went to law school for a couple of years, and... but Was the that, what, what did you set out, was that when you left... No, uh, it was all done haphazardly, I think. I, I have to admit, I I didn't really know what it was I wanted to do after. And, 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 and back in those days, English majors were at a premium. There were like, in the University of Colorado, there were like 5,000 English majors, and there were like 200 business majors. It's all reversed now. Yes. And in those days, you know, having an English degree, I didn't know what to do. So I kind of, like every other English major, I went to law school. Law school. And, but I pretty much, the one through line from being in college and law school, I went to law school in D.C., was bookstores. I just always loved being in bookstores. And, and when did you develop that passion for, it started for literature? On, it started on Miami Beach, actually. And, and the passion for literature, here's an interesting thing, really started, I think, when I was in elementary school. At Central Beach Elementary School, when I was a kid there, which is now called Ida Fisher. Yes. Uh, I mean, not Ida Fisher. It's called um, Feinberg. Feinberg uh, Fisher. He was my Feinberg yes. was my principal. They had something called a library patrol instead of the safety patrol, uh -huh. and I got put in the library patrol. I think it's because maybe I wasn't reading as much as I should have, and and they invited me into the library patrol, and every week. You would go to the library and help the librarian out. Uh -huh. And I found myself reading sports biographies and all that. But it was the first time I really discovered the power of what books could do. And then I was fortunate to have amazing teachers in in junior, in middle school, in high school, who were just some, my favorite teachers were always the English teachers. Um, you said the power of what books can do. What do you, what is that power? I mean, what is that power that we must insist that our students uh, get? Well, the beauty, I think, you know, the, there's a couple of things that I've learned over the 40 years of being teacher, a bookseller, and that is that the one thing that readers have, that non-readers have a hard time dealing with, and they have to struggle to, to get, and that is a sense of, you talked about emotional IQ, a sense of being able to, um, a sense of being able to put themselves into someone else's shoes. Empathy. And when you read fiction particularly, and you're reading about other cultures and other lives, you become very empathetic. And empathy is something that we've lost a lot in this country. Oh, yes, sir. And reading is a way to make people empathetic. It opens you up to other cultures. Oh. It, you know, just if you look at the reading lists in the high schools in mm -hmm. terms of whether it's Sandra Cisneros or whether it's mm -hmm. uh, James Baldwin, you're discovering new cultures. If you're not uh, a Latino, if you're not black, if you happen to be a, a white Anglo, you're beginning to understand what maybe other cultures are like. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that more. But, but Mitch, I don't know the statistics, but people are reading less, and you're uh, the expert. You you tell us. Well, I'm not a very good exam. I'm not a very good sounding board for that because all I do is see readers. 
mm -hmm. you know, in that sense. But there have been studies to say that people are reading less. But one of the studies that has always interested me was a few years, the NEA, a few years ago, the NEA did a study of readers. And the study was really interesting. It was that if you read one, just one piece of fiction every year, you became more civically engaged than people mm -hmm. who don't. And so mm -hmm. there was this trend to, uh, to, to reaffirm the idea that reading is a way of bringing our country together and making people more civically engaged. Absolutely, I, I agree. But I'm very concerned that in this day and age where uh, people's attention spans are so much smaller, uh, we're all used to getting whatever, you know, reading off of our telephones. Um, how do you see that uh, as, as uh, going forward? How do you see that as a bookseller? And aren't our books becoming smaller? Or are they becoming shorter? Are, are we fitting into the customer? With you know, I, I'm more hopeful. Uh, you know, I'm kind of hopeful. I mean, you know, this year with the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. This year, publishers have had their greatest year at just about ever. Really? That's good to People hear. were reading. Oh, home. good. People found themselves at home and they started reading more and more and more. And young people, I think, are beginning to understand to some extent that being hooked into, you know, uh, electronic online the online world has some precariousness to it mm -hmm. and i do find a lot of younger people moving back into reading you know young adult books are huge right now. really huge yes. uh, we had an event a couple of nights ago with two mm -hmm. miami-based mm -hmm. or south florida-based sisters who are both haitian american uh -huh. and they're the mulit sisters uh -huh. and they write their novels together oh and their books are are well known all across the country, uh -huh. and they would be very good guests, actually. Oh, well, great! <laughs> and um, they they speak to middle schoolers, young high school students. Yes, and they have a very large readership. But mm -hmm. I do think that there is a responsibility of the schools, of teachers, of parents, to make sure that mm -hmm. that that books and authors and writers are are um, are introduced into the school system in ways that are not the traditional ways. Yes. So one of the things that we've tried to do as a bookstore is whenever we have a young adult author coming to the store, we, or, or even a children's author, we try to partner with one of your schools Great. and bring them into the schools Wonderful. as well. So if a kid could see a real live person who yes. is connected with the book, it becomes a little more exciting. Now, how a lot of people uh, will not will uh, you know they, they they read from tablets and they find it very comforting. Other people they they don't like that experience. What have you found? Well, I, I can't read on on tablets. It feels too much like I'm at work, you know. <laughs> but and and actually, what's been happening, which is for me kind of cool, is that the whole ebook world went up for a while, uh -huh. but it's falling back again. And you're finding where you are finding a rise is you're finding a rise in audiobooks. Audiobooks, yes. Audiobooks are taking off. Yes. I think it's because earphones are better and people are exercising and they listen to books or they're taking they, a long yes. drive or they're commuting and that sort of thing. So audiobooks have been on the rise. Ebooks have been flat or a little bit down. And the print book is alive and well, believe it or not. Well, there have been some studies that uh, print books are better for for young children, uh, for retention, that, that they'll, they'll remember things more if they see it on, on a physical page and other things. But, um, you know, at the school district, we, we try to get them any way we, and, and as any should. way we can. As you should. So, so, um, what, uh, I know that you have, uh, very exciting things on the horizon which are your your movies the movies that yeah, you're producing yeah so about about 10 years ago i you know i've always loved movies and that's that's another way to excite kids about books mm -hmm. cuz so many books are so many books are made into film so i've always played that game you know this would make a great great movie and finally i found a book that i thought would make a great movie 
And I said, I'm going to make a movie like the old Mickey Rooney films. You know? oh, and what was that? Well, the first and one. And why? It was, the first one was called the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, uh -huh. which all of you can see on Netflix uh -huh. if you want. And it stars uh, Lily James and everybody who's in Downton Abbey. It's very, very <laughs> British. But it's about the island of Guernsey before, I mean, during World War II. Uh -huh. Guernsey and Jersey in the Channel Islands were the only islands that the Nazis actually, actually occupied. And the way this, oh, this wow. in this book, the way these people get through is by forming a book club. Uh -huh. And so what appealed to me was it was about books. It was about historical sweep, and it had all of those elements that I love in film. So my partner and I, and so I didn't know what to do. So I was introduced um, to my partner who lives in L.A., who's actually a producer, because uh -huh. I wouldn't know what to do. So I, early on, I learned that the only way you can do anything is by finding people <laughs> who know what they're doing. So I, I partnered with her, and it took us about eight or nine years, but we had it made. It came out about two years ago has done really, really well. It's still favored on Netflix. But since then, we've done three other films. We did a film called The Man Who Invented Christmas, uh -huh. again about books. It's uh -huh. about Charles Dickens and the writing of A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of your schools, uh, I, I did a Zoom event with Carver Middle, uh -huh. who showed the film, oh, and great. then had me come in and talk a little bit about oh, it oh, that's as fabulous, well. Fabulous. Which, and they showed Guernsey, I think, as well. Um, and then we did another one, which was a, about a YA book, about two kids in school who are having a very hard time psychologically. And it starred Elle Fanning. It was called All the Bright Places. It, and just two months ago, we had a book come out uh, called Let Him Go, a, a film come out starring Diane Lane and Kevin Costner. Mm -hmm. And that's done really, really well. But during the pandemic, it's very complicated. So we formed a company. It's called the Mazer Kaplan Company. We have a website, you can go on and find out what we're doing. And we have about eight or nine projects. Actually, I, we had a meeting yesterday, we have 16 projects oh, in yeah. the works right now. You, you are always- We're very excited about <laughs> Coming up stuff. with very exciting things to, to do. Um, as I said, um, and, and, and there's so many questions I want to ask you, but but uh, the essence of, of Mitch Kaplan, I think, Everyone I've ever spoken to about you, they, they've they said, you know, what a, a great guy you are. And 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 I want to hear from you. I'm going to play this for my how, kids, too. Well, no, how, <laughs> can see how important too. you think that that is and has been in your life. Because there is capital, I think, in being a nice person. Obviously, capital, we think of, of money. But so often, the fact that you're just a, a very nice person is, is uh, synonymous well, almost with money. Well, I, I think what happened with me is, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I have a temper as well, like everybody else. But I also understand... And I was raised by my parents to really be empathetic to other people. You know, I, I, I try to. Are, are you an only child? No, I have. I'm the oldest, but oh. I have three young. Uh, all of them went through the public school system. Uh -huh. I have uh, uh, two sisters and a brother who are all accomplished, doing a whole bunch of different things. But um, we were always taught to be very empathetic. My dad, my dad was a lawyer. He actually worked for. Uh, he was a union lawyer, so he worked for people who were, you know, the worker and that sort of thing. And he was a workers' comp lawyer. And my mother was always a reader and always very interested in what was happening in the world. So all of us grew up with this idea that we had to serve others in whatever capacity that we had to be able to do that. So are all your siblings as as uh, empathetic and altruistic as you I are? I great. We're all very, very close. Okay, good. And but I, I also think that uh, it, it's uh, of course it's it's taught to us by by our parents and and we are also I I, I think uh, part of it is is uh, Jeanette. I don't know. Well, no, I think I I, I you know I have to be honest. I think that we have to work hard at making sure that we keep some of the, you know, uglier parts of 
human nature at bay, <laughs> you know, one way yes. or another. We saw yesterday, unfortunately, a horrible example yes. of what happens when we don't pay attention to the truth. And truth, whether good or bad, we, we have to have a shared common idea of morality and truth and what it might be. We can disagree on various things yes. in a very uh, in a, in an important way, but we can't allow ourselves to be manipulated into living in an alternate universe. And truth to me, you know, if there's one thing that, that I distill out of everything is that when I read, when I talk to other people, I am always looking for something that will unite us. And typically what unites us is our commonality based on understanding the facts that we can agree on. Yes. Not the things we don't agree on, but the things that we do agree on. Right. And I think that if we can teach that in schools, if we, you know, I mean, you have a, the school system has a huge job ahead of them mm -hmm. because of the comp complicated nature yes. of media. When I was a kid, <laughs> you watched Walter Cronkite for the truth. Yes. Now you have to teach people you know, how to filter out certain things, you know, and how not to jump on a bandwagon yes. that might be yes. harmful to, yes. to various people. Yes, and at the same time, uh, teaching students, you know, math and reading and all of those yeah. things. Yeah, no, no. You, at the sorry. same time, the world is having all of these events that are so visible to to everyone, to our students. I mean, they obviously they they are filters. They're listening, uh, whether we think that they are uh, understanding or not. But they are certainly hearing adults and what yeah. we're up to. I think that I think I always say that my job is to create the next generation of readers. Uh -huh. And I, I imagine your job as an educator is to create the next generation of learners and people who will spend their whole life wanting to learn to learn uh, yes and how to learn yes and how to, how one how one finds out information yes those are skills that are not that don't come easily no and this year has been a tough year uh, for all I mean, of us i think what teachers have done <laughs> i have such empathy you know i see teachers all the time and and educators who come into the store and the kinds of things that people have had to go through this year and the commitment that they've yes. had to their students is just amazing. And the other thing that I think is really important is that I think parents who've had to be at home with their kids during this time, uh -huh. particularly younger kids, are understanding what teachers have, have had to, to go, go through. through. Absolutely. And I think you're going to find parents much more empathetic to, teachers. to the plight yes. of teachers. Yes. Yes. And yes. how important and, it is. And no matter what, is happening in the world our kids are growing if a child is in first grade and he doesn't get what he needs in the first grade next year it's he's one difficult. year older and and to keep in mind that we are charged with you know uh, giving the skills and 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 uh, propelling this child in this world of so with uh, so many different things that have happened that were not in, not conducive to education this year was particularly tough. And our teachers, as you say, are wonderful. But uh, I, I have so many questions, but our, our time is almost up. But I don't want uh, to go without uh, asking you, who has taught you the most in life or what event or what person has taught you the most in life, and how has that affected your extremely important and uh, a wonderful career? Well, you know, that's really a very good question. I mean, I'm, I've been very fortunate to have mentors in my life in different aspects of my life. When, you know, when, when I taught for a little while, there were some amazing teachers I looked to who helped me. Um, when I became a bookseller, there were people that I look toward and learn from. But I think at root, when I really look at it as a young person, um, as, a, as a kid going through school, I have to say my parents are the ones that, I, and, and particularly watching my father at work and watching him do what he did his whole life, it gave me, and he was passionate about the law. He unfortunately died about a year ago. but. But knowing that someone could be passionate about what they do taught me that I needed to find something in my life 
I was passionate about. And so where your work is also, you know, your work is your, your you know, what you love to do anyway, uh, where your work is not really your work, that's what taught me so, uh, something very important. And then also a sense of social justice, the idea that we need to have a sense of social justice, that we're only as, as strong as the weakest among us. That really is a kind of underpinning of everything I do. I'm very committed to making sure that, you know, that everyone from students in Title I schools to, you know, uh, people who are having a hard time, you know, uh, finding work, all of those things are really, really important. And we can't forget that. We can't forget that if we don't take care of the least fortunate among us, mm -hmm. then you know, our society suffers. From you that. know, it's, it's interesting because uh, my last guest was the superintendent and I asked him the, the same question, uh, who uh, has taught you the most? And his answer was the same as yours, basically my, my parents, but my father. And I think the importance of fathers, uh, it, it, you know, we, we, of course, our, our mothers, but our fathers are so important. And I just, wish that there would be avenues for us to be able to connect with all fathers and that all children would have that kind of relationship because obviously it, it's so important to create successful men and women. Most definitely. Yeah. I, I agree. And, and mentorship programs can help, I think, as well. As well. Yes. Yes. And I we, think that's we try. Really, we you try. Do. No, you guys, you know, I have, I just, I know that we're running out of time, but no, go ahead. Know, I think the work that you're doing at the school system, you know, I, I'm, I've always been extremely proud of uh, the Miami-Dade public school system and what it's been able to do and the challenges it's faced. You know, one of the films that we're doing, there's a new book out called uh, uh, The Year of Dangerous Days. It's about Miami in 1980. Uh -huh. And in 1980, Miami was really having a rough time. Mm -hmm. It's when Marielle happened. It's when the McDuffie riots happened. Mm -hmm. It's when the cocaine cowboys yes. were beginning. And the fact that the school system really had so much, to, the resiliency of the school system and the way it pivoted and was able to absorb all of these issues yes. and come out to be one of the strongest school systems you know, in the nation mm -hmm. is, um, it's really kind of remarkable, remarkable when you think about it. So before we end, uh, what is the future for Mitch Kaplan? Well, I I love what I do. And I, I want the legacy of books and books to continue. And I want, um, I think the work that we do is extremely important. Absolutely. I think retail is really hard right now. Uh, bookstores are really struggling. We're making it through because our community is supporting us. But I want to, I'm going to be very, you know, I, I have to find creative ways of making sure that the legacy of what we have and the important work that we do absolutely continues. Well, uh, you know, your bookstores, the cafes, the ambiance that you've been able to create and the authors that, you know, you, you're you so kind to authors. I, I think that speaks so well and, and keeps the customers coming in. I mean, I come, I, no, I go to Books and Books that. for Coffee all the time we on the weekends. And, and, and what was so great is that people bought from us online, mm -hmm. you know, and the book fair went online oh, this year. Oh, the book and fair. And what, what they do at Miami Dade College is just so incredible. And are you planning to be able to reopen? The we book? hope that we... the book fair will be physical this year. Hopefully we'll have enough inoculations. We, the book fair doesn't happen until November. November. And the new president of the college is very supportive of the okay. fair. She's a person who was very much involved in the fair oh. when she was a when she was both uh, a student as well as a teacher at Miami. College. How proud are you that this is the best book fair in the, in the United oh, it States? It gives me great satisfaction. Oh my Amazing. goodness. Oh, it's such an honor. You're, you're really, you, you, you know, for a while I was on the silver Knights committee, uh, mm -hmm. in the English judging the English silver Knights. And it used to be so such a kick to have these English students come and say, well, I developed my love of reading at the book fair. You know, these oh. are kids who were in high school, but they were brought to the book fair when they were young kids. So I, I'm, you know, it's going to be almost 
37 book fairs that we've had. Really? Kind of it amazing? seems like it was yesterday. Know, like blink, and the blink. authors that you bring and the interest and people are so happy and you know you walk around and then you go see the authors and everyone is so excited you have created isn't it cool though also there how it's a big tent under which all of miami comes yes the diversity of miami uh, uh, is yes sir you you you, you are a magician well it's yeah. not just me it's a whole team of people yes. i know i'm visible but what they do at the college and the way they throw themselves into it. But, it's but a gift. You are the visionary and we are so grateful. This community is so grateful to have you and thank you and continued success. Well, thank you. And I wish we could have more time to hear you because Well, we'll do it over lunch at the bookstore in the Oh, program. okay. Very good. Socially distance. All right. I, I don't, and and it's fabulous and uh there's social distancing and the service is fabulous. And we'll be able to, we'll, we'll just talk. All right. Thank you so much. Right. Mitch. Thank, thank you, you so much. Me. Thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to this fabulous interview with Mitch Kaplan on this uh, community newspaper Facebook uh, party. Thank you.